Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for the invitation to this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, my name is uh, Maria Perez Page, so I'm a lecturer in the Chemical Engineering and Analytical Science Department at the University of Manchester. And today uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about my work, which is mostly focused on the incorporation of uh, graphene and graphene based material into membranes as an alternative configuration for low and high temperature polymeric uh, electrolyte membrane fuel cells. Okay, however, uh, I will also uh, do an introductory part about how important are the ion chain membranes, not only in fuel cells, which is, has been the device that I've been working mostly, but also important in uh, other electrochemical energy devices such as uh, uh, the redox flow battery. Okay, so I would like to start by introducing a little bit what are the electrochemical energy devices. So I assume that uh, most of you already know what are that, what are uh, all of them, but I would like just uh, doing a brief reminder. Okay, so the electrochemical energy devices could be classified in three main categories. Okay energy storage, energy conversion, and hydrogen products. From the energy storage, we will have the redox flow battery, the lithium batteries, and the supercapacitors. Okay. Then we have, in the energy conversion, the uh, fuel cells. Um, for the hydrogen production, we have the electrolyzer. So, all of them, they have different applications. For example, the redox flow batteries will have an application more uh, to storage energy at larger scale and for stationary stations like in industry or domestic. The lithium uh, batteries and supercapacitors uh, are more focused on small devices such as uh, laptops or um, uh, uh, mobile phone mobiles, for example. And uh, also then the fuel cells that they are mostly working uh, for transportation and stationary uh, uh, places to produce energy. And finally, we have the hydrogen, uh, the electrolysis that they are going to produce hydrogen by the electrolysis of water. So for all those electrochemical energy devices, also all of them, they need a separator between the uh, anode and the cathode redox flow battery, fuel cells, and electrolyzers, all of them, they're going to need as this separator and ion chain membrane. Okay. So if we go to the description of an electrochemical energy devices, all of them, they have a similar configuration. They have two electrodes, anode and cathode, which correspond with a positive and a negative half cell. Then one of one of the main roles that we will have on the membrane for that is that it has to be a separator between the positive and negative half cell, okay, to avoid the short circuit between both electrodes. Apart from that, the membrane needs to be a good ion conductivity, okay, uh, a good ion conductor to complete the current circuit by transferring ions. This high conductivity is required to minimize the losses in the voltage efficiency. However, also we need a good ion transport. We need as well a high ion selectivity. That means that the membrane should allow the transport of the desired ions, but at the same time must avoid the permeation of the redox at this species. So that means that we need to allow the ions going from anode and cathode or cathode and anode, but at the same time we need that the redox active spaces cannot go through the membrane. Okay, these redox active spaces uh, they are going to be different depending on the electrochemical energy devices that we are talking about. For example, if we are talking about fuel cells, so these active spaces they're going to be the fuel, or if we are talking about vanadium uh, redox flow batteries, so it's going to be the vanadium ions, the ones that we want to avoid to travel between both anodes, okay? So, apart from that, uh, when we have the permeation of this species, of this active species from one side to another side, 
that will lead different problems on those devices that we will discuss later on the presentation. Okay, but in general, all of them they will provide a decrease in the performance of the devices. Another important properties of those membranes are the chemical uh, stability, for example. So in redox flow batteries, those device, those membranes, they are gonna operate it in a, a sulfuric acid environment. So this is a really a strong chemical and it's gonna be oxidizing and we could damage this, uh, uh, this membrane and also they will be uh, decrease the life of the battery. Other important things is like a uh, high temperature. So those uh, membranes should be uh, be resistant to some of temperatures. OK, some high temperatures, not really high, but at some point, for example, in, in uh, uh, fuel cells, we can work at temperatures around 100 Celsius degrees. So uh, that means that uh, we need those membranes be stable and those temperatures. So we have different three main types of ion chain membranes. OK, the first of all that we have is the ion chain membrane. Those membranes uh, have positive, they are positive charted. OK, they have these positive uh, functional groups on their structure. And they're going to allow the transport of the ions while rejecting the cations. OK, so that membranes, they will allow that the anions uh, go through one side to another side of the of the electrodes. OK, and the application of those membranes, they are mostly on alkaline fuel cells and also they are they are using sometimes or as separators for vanadium uh, redox flow battery. OK, as they has been uh, noticed that those membranes, they uh, decrease the crossover of the vanadium. Since uh, those membranes are positively charged, so only the ions can pass through it through them. So the crossover of the positive charged vanadium ions will be decreased drastically. So <clears throat> the next uh, uh, the next type of membranes are the uh, amphoteric ion chain membranes. OK. These uh, membranes contain cationic and as well as ionic chain groups. Okay, and uh, the advantage of this membrane is that you cannot use the composition and allow and control the ion chain properties that we have. These membranes they are not using uh, really often in electrochemical energy devices. They has been tested uh, for some uh, research group on vanadium redox flow batteries, but they are not quite popular uh, yet on that. And finally, we have the cation chain membranes. OK, so this, the, these membranes, they are the most used in electrochemical energy devices, more particularly the membranes that they allow the proton conductivity, so proton uh, chain membranes. OK, as this name says, it's like the they are membranes that allow the transport of the cations and reject the anions. OK. And they are the most. They are mostly application on the polymeric electrolyte membrane fuel cells. Okay, even high temperature or low temperature fuel cells, polymeric electrolyte membranes and in electrolyzers, and also in redox flow batteries. Here we have a table with uh, several uh, different uh, proton chain membranes that we can use. You can find on different literature, and you can. They have been using in different uh, fuel cells, high temperature fuel cells mostly. Uh, however, so far, even if uh, there are a lot of uh, of those membranes, the most popular proton chain membrane that has been using in those technologies are Nifion and PVI. Okay, so far they are the ones that provide higher conductivity proton conductivity and higher conditions for those membranes, for those uh, electrochemical energy devices. So, so far, Nifion is uh, the most used proton exchange membrane because of its chemical stability and because it's an excellent proton conductor. OK, it has a really good uh, proton uh, conductivity. Nafion it has been discovered by DuPont and has been using from uh, uh, 1960s. Okay, so this is the, the 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 name of the brand. 
Okay, this is a button brand. So, uh, and this uh, polymer is a sulfonated fluorinated polymer with a copolymer molecular structure. So the polymer consists in a strong hydrophobic backbone and a regular space sorter per fluor vinyl ether side chains. And each of them terminated with a strong hydrophilic sulfonic acid group. So this membrane has the particularity that is uh, hydrophobic hydrophilic and hydrophobic at the same time. So it has this backbone that is hydrophobic, but this part of the membrane makes the membrane hydrophilic. Okay, so Nathan shows a good phase separation between the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic phase, leading a very well interconnected hydrophilic phase due to the high flexibility of the uh, fluorocarbon backbone of the polymer. So that is the reason the fluorocarbon backbone is the reason uh, because this polymer is really uh, is an excellent chemical uh, has an excellent chemical stability. And the hydrophilic groups are the responsible for the proton conductivity by dissociation in contact with the protic and the polar solvent. Among a large of list of the commercial polymers, as I said, nation is the most uh, the highest good proton conductivity and has the highest chemical stability as well. So this is because uh, the main application is in low temperature pen fuel cells and in reduced flow batteries. Okay. However, uh, this, this polymer also has some disadvantages. So the first of all is, as I, I said, we need uh, so this polymer depends on the hydrophilic part of the uh, of the molecule to conduct protons, so it needs to be humidified to conduct the protons. So that's going to uh, provide as a limitation of the temperature for the fuel cells. Also has a crossover, so it's not really depending on the system that we are working and the fuels uh, sometimes allows the uh, active species uh, travel through it. Okay, so from anodside or cathode and also it's really expensive material so far. So then let's go on to see how these disadvantages will affect us uh, in the different electrochemical energy devices. So the first limitation that uh, I said that this uh, membrane has is, uh, the, is the limitation of the temperature. So what that means? So that means that this membrane uh, it will be a really good proton conductor, but if it has really, uh, if it is uh, perfectly hydrated, okay? So in the moment that this membrane is not going to be hydrated, so it's not going to conduct protons anymore. So this is a, a limitation on the temperature because we cannot work at temperatures larger than 100 Celsius degree. So the, and this problem is more specific for uh, lower temperature pen fuel cells that they use hydrogen as a fuel. So what is the problem of that? If we cannot work at temperatures around 100 Celsius degrees, so more or less this, the operation temperature of these uh, fuel cells are around 80 Celsius degree approximately. Okay, so but and then the problem, this limitation of the temperature, it will affect to the slow cinetic of the reaction. Okay, more particularly the, the oxygen reduction reaction. Why? Because we know that the cinetic of the reaction, it will depend on the temperature. So at larger temperature we are working, the cinetic of the reaction is better. But we are limited for that, so sometimes we have this limitation, particularly in this particular reaction inside of the, uh, the fuel cell. If we take a look to a theoretical uh, uh, polarization curve of a fuel cell. So the polarization curve of a fuel cells is kind of the identity of the fuel cells. It's going to tell us how good or how bad performs these fuel cells. So this problem that we have, this slow cinetic, we are going to affect to the first region of this polarization curve. That is the activation part of, is the activation region of the fuel cells. Okay. But as I said, as I said, if we are working to a smaller temperature, to temperatures around 100 Celsius degrees, so we are going to have a 
membrane is going to be dehydrated. Okay, so that means that the proton conductivity of the membrane is not gonna is not working. Okay, so that means that we are gonna increase the resistance of the membranes. And as we are going to increase the resistance of the membranes, we are going to have also some losses in the opmic region of the uh, polarization of the polarization curve of the fuel cell. So the way to solve it that is that we will need to hydrate the gases for uh, the fuel cells, either the hydrogen and also the oxygen as well. Okay, so that means that we have to add a new system, so we need to humidify those gases, so we need a humidifier as well for those uh, for those gases. That means that we are going to have a more complex system and also uh, more expensive, okay? So the next problem that we have with this nation is, as I said, is the crossover, okay? So for example, this crossover problem, it will affect more to uh, lower temperature fuel cells, but temperature that they are, uh, that use uh, methanol as a fuel, so indirect methanol fuel cells. What this crossover is, so what is the, what mean that crossover? So as I barely explained before, the crossover, in this case, the crossover of the methanol is happen when we have some methanol from the anode side, where is where we have the, uh, the methanol solution this part of this methanol, it will migrate to the cathode side, okay? So if we have this problem, what is gonna happen? So first of all, it's like, we will have less amount of methanol in the anode side. And then in the cathode side, we will have the oxygen to, uh, to produce its uh, own reaction, but we will have also some uh, methanol on this cathode side. So then we will have also a reaction of the methanol. So we will have two reactions. The one, the proper one in the cathode side that uh, depends on the oxygen, and also we have some reaction with the methanol as well. So that means that we are gonna have low efficiency. Okay, this is really important in direct methanol fuel cells. We will have a loss of the voltage in this performance and we will have a mixed potential for all those things that we have. So here we will have less methanol, so we have less product. We have an extra reaction here, we have the mixed potential. So in, in general, we will have a loss of the voltage and a low efficiency of the fuel cell. How is going to reflect this in uh, the theoretical, uh, in the um, in the polarization curve. So if we compare this, uh, the theoretical uh, polarization curve and a real polarization curve of a direct methanol fuel cell, so we can see that, for example, the OCP is smaller than the theoretical one. So it's really low in comparison with that. This is because of the crossover of the methanol. So as we have a lot of methanol that is going from the anode side to the cathode side, we have less methanol to react in the anode side. So that means that we have less OCB, okay? And then also it's gonna uh, affect as well to the region of the, uh, to the ohmic region uh, because the resistance of the membrane is gonna be uh, smaller as well. And also we have some problems uh, because uh, in the catalyst part, because this mixed potential will produce some carbon monoxide, so that carbon monoxide could uh, contaminate the platinum, that this is the catalyst, so that is gonna be, uh, even the degradation of the platinum, it could, have, it could happen faster as well. This problem of the crossover, we have it as well on uh, vanadium redox flow battery, okay? So we have here the typical system of the vanadium flow batteries, so here we have the decide the the decide the things that we want that the, the ion chain membrane uh, act. Okay, so as we said before, we want these uh, ions uh, be transported from one side to another side, but we don't want that the active species they are going from one side to another side. So what is the problem of that? So for example, if we take a look to uh, a general system of our uh, vanadium redox flow batteries, that means is that uh, in 
the negative electrolyte, we will have uh, the reaction of the uh, vanadium-3 to vanadium-2, and here we will have the other, uh, this, uh, this other uh, reaction from vanadium-5 and vanadium-4. If we have some of these uh, ions of vanadium from the cathode side to the anode side, here we will have other reactions. And the opposite, if some of this vanadium is going to this side, so we will have different reactions. So that means that we will have charge and discharge in the same uh, in the same half positive at the same time. So that it will decrease a lot the efficiency of the vanadium redox batteries. So as an alternative of this nafion, the other most popular uh, uh, polymer is uh, PBI. Okay, the Vince, uh, this PBI polymer uh, has also a good properties, okay, it has a good mechanical resistance, high proton conductivity, good thermal stability, and doesn't need humidification. Okay, so this polymer, it conduct protons in a different way than uh, nafion. But in order to conduct polymer, to conduct protons, sorry, uh, it will need to be doped with an acid. Okay, so the most typical one is the phosphoric acid. So we need to dop this polymer with phosphoric acid to complete the network of the hydrogen bond to conduct the proton. So that means that the PBA by itself is not going to conduct any proton. So we will always need this phosphoric acid to conduct that, uh, to conduct the proton. So the conductivity of this membrane, they're going to depend on how on the level of the doping that we have for this phosphoric acid. And with this uh, polymer, we can achieve temperatures around 120 or 150 Celsius degrees. Okay, so this is, uh, we use it as well on PEM fuel cells, uh, polymeric chain membrane fuel cells, and this is because we call high temperatures. So we know that in, in chemical engineering, uh, when we are talking about high temperatures, like temperatures around 8,000, 600, something like that. But so we call high temperature because it's like we can achieve temperature larger than uh, 100 Celsius degree. That is uh, the limitation of the temperature for Navy. However, this uh, membrane also have problems in, uh, in the high temperature fuel cells, okay? Because of the mechanisms of the, of the proton conductivity, the phosphoric acid can be lit from uh, the catalyst layer when the temperatures are lower than 100 Celsius degree, for example, because this phosphoric acid could be uh, could be dissolved in the water that is produced on the cathode side. But when we are working at higher temperature, also we will have a higher significance of the leaching of the phosphoric acid. And also it will happen more when the fuel cell is working for a long time. So what is the problem of this leaching of phosphoric acid? So that means that if the phosphoric acid is leaving the membrane, it could take some catalyst and we can, and this catalyst could be uh, disappear from the catalyst layer. So then we are gonna, we will have different problems. On one side, we are gonna decrease the conductivity of the membrane because it's gonna depend on the phosphoric acid. And if we have less phosphoric acid on the membrane, we don't have this conductivity. And also because the catalysis migrate uh, from uh, the uh, from the catalyst layer to the microporous layer, so the reaction is gonna decrease the efficiency. The other important problem is like if we got a, a lot of phosphoric acid on the gas diffusion layer, we will increase the mass the mass transport resistance as well. Okay, so. With all those problems that I mentioned, so we are looking for some strategies to improve these ion chain membranes. In the first part, we're looking for uh, different nafion configurations. Why nafion? Because as I mentioned so far, the nafion is the uh, the best uh, proton conductor membrane that we can find in the market. So a lot of strategies they are following in order to uh, to uh, develop different configurations of nafion how we can do different nafion configurations. So for example, one idea is like uh, add a barrier material on the uh, surface of the nafion, for example. So here it will be the typical uh, uh, pen fuel cell. Okay, so where it could, for example, if we look in for the methanol, uh, as I said before, so it, the methanol crossover, 
So this one you can go from the methanol could, uh, uh, could be migrated from the site of the fuel cells to the other side of the membrane. So the idea is like a stop like at a barrier here before the membrane. Okay. So for example, one idea is could add some material here that it will act as a barrier. So this material there could be some material that gonna affect the proton conductivity. Okay. And for example, the most typical that we are using that are um, for, uh, theolite, for example, more than it. So this way, this barrier could reject the methanol, but at the same time, the protons can go uh, through the through the membrane. Another idea of different configuration could be uh, uh, another different configurations of nafion could be uh, adding different structure of membranes, for example. Uh, this work that we developed, so we tested different ways of uh, how uh, add different um, different layers of nafion to achieve the same thickness of a nafion 115. Okay, we did some different approaches, and also we add in some of cases uh, uh, CNC cellulose nanocrystals in the middle. So. The advantages of these those different configurations with uh, polymers that we already have is that uh, we are going to add in the individual properties of the membrane. So we are not going to lose any properties of the membranes. We are going to increase the tortuosity, so it's going to be more difficult for the methanol or vanadio uh, migrate or go through the membrane. And we are going to improve the mechanical properties of the membranes as well. And this way it is really easy to uh, to synthesize so we can do uh, this electrolyte really easy so <clears throat> for example for this membrane for this paper this, this work that we did we found out that the best uh, configuration that we had was when we put together a layer of the nafion 211 in the middle uh, we spray this uh, carbon cellulose and then we add two layers of nafion 212. Okay, so all everything together, it will have the same thickness of the nafion 115. But we uh, prove that the methanol flux density, so the, the permeation of the methanol, decreased significantly if we compare with the uh, plain nafion 115, like 11%. And we found an improvement of the fuel cells around the 38% of improvement in the uh, power, maximum power density. Then the next uh, the next uh, way to improve this uh, <clears throat> this uh, ion chain membranes are uh, instead of uh, doing different configurations, it's like also in incorporating the matrix the the filler materials so those materials into the matrix membranes, so doing some composite membranes. Okay. So those materials that we are using, they are mostly uh, inorganic materials, such as theolites, metal oxide, as, uh, that I mentioned before. And also we want to add some hydrophilic materials because we also want to improve the water content of the membrane. So because, uh, as I mentioned before, for low temperature fuel cells, we use hydrogen. The main problem is not uh, the crossover of the hydrogen, for example. The main problem is the dehydration of the membrane. So that means that this is changes a little bit the structure of the membrane, but those materials inside of the structure of the membrane could also increase the tortuosity of, uh, of the membrane, and it could be more difficult for the methanol go through it. Methanol or another different uh, system. So in base of in this uh, in this way. Uh, the work that I've been working mostly is uh, using uh, 2D materials, either for added as a barrier of the membrane or as a composite membrane. Okay, so uh, the concept that we are using or, or why we can use a graphene as a barrier, so is if we have this, this is the microstructure of uh, our uh, fuel cells. So we have here the membrane, we have the catalyst and the gas diffusion layer. So the idea to avoid, as I mentioned before, the crossover is at a barrier between the membrane and the catalyst layer. 
And for that, we are going to use graphing. And why graphing? So the idea to use graphing is because in 2006, under game at the University of Manchester, uh, they published a native paper, really famous native paper, in which he mentioned that the single layer graphing is an ideal uh, barrier for most of the substance, but only the protons could go through uh, this material. So that means that it could be the perfect proton chain membrane for us, but the problem that we have is that this is electrical conductor, so that means that we need also uh, a polymer uh, uh, together with that. So we try to prove uh, these things, okay? We try to prove that this graphene single layer could also a barrier for methanol fuel cells, okay? So the thing that we did is we add this graphene single layer in uh, the electrode on, on the top of the NAFU membrane, okay? So first of all, the graphene has been grown by carbon vapor deposition uh, over a copper substrate. Then we add uh, this uh, polymethyl metraculate uh, on the top, okay, to take this uh, graphene layer. We immerse everything in an ammonium persulfate solution. This way we can remove the copper. And finally, we uh, put inside this in a dionysic water bath, okay? And then we add the nafion on the bottom of this uh, carbon uh, of this graphene layer. So finally, for that, we introduce in a vacuum oven to remove uh, uh, to evaporate the water, and finally, we introduce in acetone to remove the polymer. Okay, we rise with water, and we got our nafion over uh, our uh, single layer graphene over the nafion structure. And then we sandwich it and we uh, hot press between the anode and the cat. Uh, okay. so the results that we got for that uh, is like we tested uh, different single, uh, different electrodes covered with different single, uh, single layers. Okay, and we always found that uh, we got an improvement on the uh, uh, an improvement in the power density in the power density in compare with the standard MEA. Okay, so this difference between sample A and sample B is because uh, either when we are doing the transfer, not always we got a perfect transfer, so always we have some defects. So that means that it's important to control the transfer of our uh, of our graphing. And so we can find that because the, uh, with the impedance that we didn't have any important changes on the proton conductivity of those uh, of those uh, membranes. So the proton conductivity is more or less the same for the three samples. So for that also we try different coverage as I mentioned because everything is imp uh, is important the, the the coverage of the of the electrode or the membrane and we found that. Uh, as we have more coverage on our system, the power, the maximum power density increase, and at the same time, the methanol permeability decrease with the increasing of the uh, of the coverage of our reactor. So then we also try, as I mentioned, the problem that we have with uh, the uh, with the high temperature fuel cells are the phosphoric acid leaching. So we did in collaboration with uh, UCL. We are trying to uh, characterize how this uh, phosphoric acid leaching happen using uh, tomography. Okay, so here we can see uh, the uh, how the different layers that we can find in our uh, MEA. Okay, and how the phosphoric acid is distributed around our uh, MEA. Okay, so for that. Uh, we can see that here we have the small, the the, the different uh, the different layers of our system. That here we have the pristine MEA and an MEA after 100 hour working. So we can see that the amount of uh, phosphoric acid increased significantly in uh, inside of our system on our MEA. Also, we can see that the uh, the catalyst lay the catalyst is degraded as well, so it's moving from uh, from uh, the catalyst layer. So we have more catalyst around when we have a 
MEA that has been using for a long time. Okay, so again, so as we mentioned before, the thing that we try to avoid this phosphoric acid leaching is at single layer graphene as a barrier there. So what we found in this uh, in this system, so we found that indeed when we test when we add the single layer graphene as a, as a barrier, we got a significant improvement on our uh, power density. Okay, so the power density that we got when we add this uh, single layer graphene is uh, higher. So that means that uh, we got a better performance, so probably less uh, uh, less phosphoric acid leaching. And if we take a look as well on the long time uh, uh, performance of the uh, fuel cell, we can see as well that the single layer graphene MEA is more stable and the standard MEA is decreasing with the time. Okay. However, as I mentioned, use this single layer graphene is quite expensive and quite difficult because it will, it, it's going to depend a lot about the coverage and how we transfer uh, this uh, single layer graphene for the CVD graphene. So then uh, the other idea is instead of use this single layer graphene, is use uh, uh, graphene oxide. Okay, graphene oxide composite membranes. The graphene oxide is a graphene based material who has also a 2D structure but this material has a uh, different functional groups okay like the carboxyl hydroxyl or epoxy those functional groups that this uh, graphing this material has they're going to provide this material a particular property so that means that this material it will be have a lot of hydrophilic properties so it's a hydrophilic uh, material like water and because all we have all those uh, uh, functional groups we can uh, functionalize this material. That means that we can add some uh, atoms and molecules to uh, improve the properties that we want. For example, uh, make the material more hydrophilic because we want more water inside of our navy. So the thing that we did is we functionalized this graphene oxide with APTS. So this is a molecular because uh, it has this amine group uh, it likes water more, so it's a hydrophilic uh, material. So we are going to make our material more uh, hydrophilic and we are going to introduce in our membrane. So with that, we found that, uh, I mean, the ions could go through this membrane, but we are going to reject as well the active species. So we tested this material, uh, these composite membranes in the methanol fuel cells at different temperatures or with different contents of this material. And we found that with a really small amount of this material inside of our membranes, we can get a significant improvement on the, on the performance of the direct methanol fuel cells. Uh, then we tested as well, this is like 75% of improvement and a higher temperature 90% of improvement. So that means that also working a higher temperature, we got a, a better performance. So that means that this could be also because uh, the membrane, it could retain water better. So then we tested as well on hydrogen fuel cells in collaboration with Imperial College London. And we also found that for these uh, membranes, uh, in, uh, using hydrogen, we got also an improvement, significant improvement on our performance using a really a small amount of uh, graphene oxide. As well, we tested in high temperature fuel cells, so we add graphene oxide in uh, into PVI. We create uh, graphene uh, PVI graphene oxide membranes, and also we found an improvement of this performance with uh, a higher amount of PVA, so with a uh, 2% of uh, uh, graphene oxide. Also, we proved that uh, the proton conductivity uh, is higher, so we have less resistance uh, of the proton conductivity, uh, adding the graphene, and the crossover of the membrane is even uh, is also lower. So if we have a little, a little bit of crossover, so we can decrease it uh, by adding this graphene oxide inside of the PVA. And additional to that, so we also tested different uh, 2D materials in a different membrane for high temperatures. So in this case, uh, we use uh, 2D silicon nanocyte that we introduced in a polyether sulfone polyvinyl sulfur diet. And we found as well that uh, 
we got a higher proton conductivity with these membranes inside of uh, with this uh, material inside of the of the membrane okay so we tested also different loadings of the uh, to the silicon nanosheets and we improved the proton conductivity for that and finally our last award is adding as well this another 2d materials okay this 2d material this the muscovite natural muscovite has been incorporated as well in a pbi matrix okay uh, we also tested different amounts of this material and uh, we found that uh, this material has an important influence on the proton conductivity and the power density and the durability of the uh, of the membrane and the fuel cells because it has been found that the hydroxyl groups that the muscovite surface has can, act, uh, can interact with the phosphoric acid molecules to a four continuous proton transport pathway leading an enhancement of the proton conductivity and a power density okay that we got a uh, proton conductivity of 42.2 millisiemens per centimeter square and a uh, power density of 586 millibars per centimeter squared at the temperature of uh, 100. okay so here we have the the, the different the different performance that we obtain and also we found that uh, after the degradation so after the degradation of the membrane after uh, working for several time and different uh, accelerated stress test uh, experiment done we can see that uh, also when we add this uh, material inside of the pba the performance the decay rate is uh, lower than what we are using only pba so Finally, here we have the mapping Margaret, can, of. Can, if you have time, can you please round up so that we can also have uh, some short, uh, some break before we continue with the. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's 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 my my final slide. Sorry, so that is that's mostly showing that uh, after the accelerated stress test, so we found that okay, so uh, we can see this yellow thing means that is our the the phosphoric acid so when we have only pba so there is almost nothing on the membrane but we can keep these things uh, when we add this uh, material inside of our membrane so we can keep the the phosphoric acid on the membrane when we add this material inside of the on the membrane so that is uh, everything so uh, thank you all of you for your attention i'm happy to answer any question that you could have